what are your favorite occupational therapy resources? Today on the show, I'll be sharing your responses to last month's question of the month, announcing this month's new question, introducing the first official lifer of the month, and also letting you in on some fun things happening over at OT for Life. That includes the boot and a super fun 30-day movement challenge. If you're interested in occupational therapy, this is the place for you. This show aims to explore our profession by sharing who we are and what we do. Because for us, occupational therapy is more than just a job. Hi, I'm Sarah. Welcome to OT for Life. This past month, I started a new segment on the show called The Question of the Month. And I reached out to the OT for Life community for help with this. I asked the question, what are your favorite occupational therapy resources? And let me just say, you absolutely delivered. I left it pretty open because I wanted to see the wide range of recommended resources from the community. I'll be sure to throw in my two cents at the end, but here's what you had to say about your favorite occupational therapy resources. Hello, lovely. This is Shannon from Shannon Marie of T. And my go-to resources are AOTA tip sheets available at AOTA's website, webinars from LSVT Global that I use to keep up with my LSVT big certification. And last but not least, what and probably what I use the most frequently is the Senior Flourish Learning Lab that Mandy Chamberlain created. Her private Facebook group and the resources on the website are always on my browser. Lately, I have been using her brand new adult OT goal writing guide, which I highly recommend to any and everyone working with adults in any setting. So you guys can find me at Shannon Marie underscore OT on Instagram or ShannonMarieOT.com on the blog. Sarah, thanks for giving us this opportunity to share our resources. I look forward to hearing everyone else's. Thanks, Shannon, for chiming in about those fantastic resources, some of which were pretty specific to working with adults and older adults, but also some like the AOTA tip sheets cover other practice areas as well. Hi, Sarah. This is me with OT with me and Mindfulness in Motion. I wanted to share one of my favorite resources with the community. If you haven't heard of understood.org, I highly recommend it. I recommend this to all of the parents that I work with. Understood.org is a huge inclusion advocate for people who learn and think differently, like those with ADHD, dyslexia, or just overall learning differences, so they can thrive at their home, work, or school. They have tons of resources for educators, families, and employers on their website to help us as practitioners or teachers or parents or guardians better understand how to help their loved ones succeed. They also have amazing podcast episodes. And they have research-based articles that are so easy to understand, teaching strategies, free resources that you can print, and there's so much more. Go check them out. Another one of my favorite resources is a Google app called Jamboard. So it's like an interactive whiteboard that has been the best thing to use for virtual sessions. It works like a Google Doc, so it allows the student and the therapist is to be on at the same time and you can see in real time what the student is doing and you can correct them in real time or just create things. So I've made boards like tic-tac-toes. I've created figure ground boards and I have them practice their handwriting on there and there's so much more that you can do and I love this the most because it's so customizable and it has worked like a charm with working with my students with autism because I can create these boards that are so client-centered and include highly reinforcing characters on there to promote participation. So I have a little tutorial on my Instagram page if anyone wants to check it out. It's OT with me and me is spelled M-Y. I am so glad that I asked this question because some of the mentioned resources I've never heard of or I know very little about and now I cannot wait to go check them out. These are definitely ones that I need to go take a look at. Thanks me for sharing about these. Hey, Sarah, this is Miranda from the OT Uncorked podcast. One of my favorite resources in practice comes from Model Systems. It's actually Model Systems Knowledge Translation Center, but they provide really great resources for spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, and burn injury, and they really focus on 
knowledge translation. So they're involved in research, but they also provide really great clinical tools. So for example, they have different fact sheets and resources for practice. So these are things that I print out for my clients and their families a lot, and we go through them together as educational tools. They also have different presentations and videos. They write articles about hot topics. They do kind of quick reviews of intervention strategies and give you the lowdown on the evidence. So it's an awesome resource. Highly recommend them if you work with any of their the populations they work with, so spinal cord injury, brain injury, and burn injury. You can find them online, msktc.org, which again is for Model Systems Knowledge Translation Center. And I just think they have fabulous, high-quality evidence-based resources. So thanks so much. Yep. Another resource I was unaware of. Sounds absolutely amazing for anybody that works with burns, spinal cord injury, or brain injury. I'm always looking to expand and increase my evidence-based practice, and this resource definitely does that. Hey, hey, this is Danielle from Mornings with an OT Mom. Since we are all about sharing resources via the Instagram platform, I wanted to share some of my favorite resources that are aside from Instagram. So for some school-based resources, I love for intervention planning. Anything from Tools to Grow, Go Noodle, Milkshake is my favorite video. I love to order therapy supplies from Fun and Function, Lakeshore. And locally in the Redlands area, Jack's Toy Store and Kasui has some awesome... Jack's Toy Store, you guys should just Google them anyway. They're just an amazing local toy store that has literally everything that an occupational therapist could dream about using in therapy. Kasui has a lot of modern and super organic and amazing things that I always can use for therapy material. And I also wanted to recommend Kith, which does have an online store for getting outfits for those IEPs and business meetings and looking just amazing all the time. Plus the humans that work there are all amazing as well. Also school-based uh, Bala Physics. I do like that program a lot and the school-based OT and PT group. Oh man, Danielle coming in clutch with so many awesome resources for pediatric and school-based occupational therapy practitioners from toys to products to programs to clothing and Facebook groups. You covered a lot of resources here. I'll add that there are also a bunch of Facebook groups depending on what practice area you're looking for. There are OT-specific groups and some that are collaborative with many different professionals like PT and speech. One of my favorites is the OT Entrepreneur Facebook group, as well as any of the four OT groups like MH4OT and OT4OT. Go check them out and you can run a search in the group to find specific topics that you're looking for. And next up, we have Kim Loak from the OT Way. Hi, Sarah. It's Kim Lowack, OT in Texas. My favorite resource is Harold Blomberg's Rhythmic Movements. It addresses autism, sensory processing, reflex integration, diet, technology, and it gives the basic movements to start a reflex integration program. It's just one of my favorites. Hang on. I'm opening up a browser right now and digging into all this goodness as we speak. Wow. I cannot wait to learn more about this topic, and I also see that Harold Bloomberg wrote a book. Totally adding that to my book list now. Hi, my name is Lauren. I'm an occupational therapist who works in skilled nursing in Ohio, and my top two favorite resources right now are Sarah Lyons, OT Potential. She posts a different research article every week, and it's always really interesting to hear Sarah's take on what it means for occupational therapy because they're all very relevant to hot topics in OT. My second favorite resource is from Mandy from Senior Flourish. Senior Flourish has been a lifesaver. I'm new. I'm a new graduate, and I'm very new to skilled nursing and I'm forever grateful for the resources, the handouts, the videos, the Facebook community, all of it. Senior Flourish is a must for me and it's probably my personal favorite go-to resource. I am a big fan of Sarah Lyon from OT Potential and Mandy Chamberlain from Seniors Flourish as well. They both put out fantastic podcasts. Sarah's being all about evidence-based practice and Mandy's about working with older adults. If you have not checked out their shows yet, do it. They're absolutely wonderful. And I also wanted to mention that Leticia Ortiz commented in the OT for Life community that OT Potential is one of her go-to OT resources as well. Hi, OT for Lifers. It's Taylor from Taylor Made OT here. I just wanted to pop on to share a little bit about some of my favorite OT resources. 
I personally really like following a few of the pediatric OT accounts on Instagram because I really like scrolling through and getting inspired and some creative activity ideas that I can use with my own kiddos on my caseload. Some of those are OT Butterfly, Coda Life, Miss Jamie OT, Woo Therapy. Those come to mind right off the top of my head. And then also, I really like being part of something a little bit more formal, which is the Tools to Grow membership site. So when you log in and pay for their membership, I believe it's for the year, you get access to all of their printables and handouts and things like that. That's really nice to have. There's all kinds of themes and stuff with tons and tons of stuff in there. So it's definitely worth it. And I highly recommend those resources. So much inspiration can be found on social media these days, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and there's even some emerging OT practitioners on TikTok. Hashtag get inspired for sure. And I had another mention of tools to grow on the community page from Clarissa. Coming up next is Janelle Main from My Main Wardrobe. My favorite OT resource that I have been using a lot lately has to be from Sensational Brain. It's a course that I took on self-regulation that I have access to all these amazing downloads and articles talking about sensory processing. So there's a lot of sensory and behavior questionnaires, um, a lot of sensory-based games, intervention plans, just chock full of sensory processing goodness that I can use with my kids that I service at the schools. Gotta love a good course and webinar. I haven't done any from Sensational Brain, but they sound fantastic. I've done a bunch of different sensory courses, the SOS approach to feeding, the Beckman oral motor protocol, the hippotherapy level one training course, as well as some fieldwork educator courses, and I've loved them all. Hey, Sarah, Alexis Joel here. So aside from podcasts such as yours, I have to say I'm a little corny in that I obsess over occupational therapy students being my go-to resource. Even though I've been in practice since 2011 over multiple settings and all kinds of different areas, I love being able to see what occupational therapy students are up to in our field works, in our social media, in our associations for occupational therapy, to see what they're cooking up, what they've learned, what's new, what they're developing, their creative brains that they bring to the table. I love it. I nerd out on it because there's always something new and to learn and explore in our field. All these emerging interests and settings and relevancies related to our social experience in living life in today's age. And that will change in five years and that will change in 10 years. And so why not learn from the best who are our new and bright practitioners in the field and assistants as well? Gosh, I love my occupational therapy assistant contacts and those who I have yet met. I couldn't agree more with this statement. I love being a fieldwork educator and learning from my students. And honestly, they keep me current on what's being taught and discussed within the world of academia and also have so many amazing and novel treatment ideas. Being that I currently have two level two fieldwork students with me right now, I decided to ask them what their go-to resources are. And here's what they said. They love following hashtags on Instagram, hashtag pediatric OT. And they also mentioned that they love the Pedretti Pediatric Textbook and the Case Smith Pediatric Textbook. Hi, Sarah. It's Deborah Battistella from Creative Concepts in Occupational Therapy. I love your question. I've learned that as an NBCOT certificate, we have access to ProQuest, and it's very easy to find. Once you log into the NBCOT website, as a certificate, there is a link for research tools, and that brings you right to ProQuest, where you can search for evidence-based articles. Also, working for a teaching hospital or a teaching healthcare system, likely people have access to science libraries. I know that I work for a teaching system, and many of my colleagues over the years have not been aware that we have access to a library. So if you work for a teaching system, I recommend 
talking to people in leadership to find out if there is a library that you can have access to. Thanks a lot. This is a great question. Thanks for starting this conversation. I really appreciate you and your podcast. Thanks, Deborah. I always appreciate getting an educator's perspective. And I have to admit that I'd completely forgotten about the access to ProQuest through NBCOT. And to be honest, now I've used it a few times since getting your voicemail. Wow. What great responses and resources. I'll have a link to all the above mentioned resources in the show notes. And if you have any others that you'd like to add to the list, head on over to otforlife.com slash community slash resources and chime in your thoughts. As for my go-to resources, it's no surprise here. I would have to say my favorite occupational therapy resources are podcasts. I've said it before and I will say it again. I absolutely love listening to podcasts, especially OT podcasts, for information about different practice areas, programs, or research, as well as to learn from other people's stories and experiences. And I'm not the only one who recommended OT podcasts as a resource. A few of the voicemails also mentioned podcasts, as well as Amelia, the lymph therapist, Heather, and Kelsey commented in the OT for Life community on how much they really enjoy listening to OT podcasts. There are more and more occupational therapy podcasts popping up these days, so you're bound to find one or many that might suit your fancy. There are some that are super focused on a specific area like school-based practice, working with older adults, or OT entrepreneurship. There are some that are hosted by students detailing their journey as an OT or OTA student, and some from OT practitioners all across the globe. If you want to check out some of the ones that I listen to, head on over to otforlife.com slash OT podcasts. And you can also check out the website, www.otpodcasts.com, which is a site that Brock Cook from the Occupied Podcast put together that also has a long list of occupational therapy podcasts. A big thanks to everybody who left a voicemail or commented on the question of the month. And a huge shout out goes to Deborah Battistella, who did both. Deborah, you are the lucky winner this month and will have some OT for Life swag coming your way. Are you ready for the next question of the month? Drum roll, please. Our next question of the month has to do with staying organized. I want to know, how do you keep your OT brain and OT materials organized? To answer the question, you can leave a voicemail at otforlife.com slash voicemail and comment on the post at otforlife.com slash question. I look forward to hearing all that you have to say about how you stay organized. And just like this month, I'll be giving away some more swag for your responses. You'll get one entry for leaving a voicemail or a comment, but if you do both, I'll give you five entries into the drawing, so make sure to get your answers in. The next thing that I want to introduce you to is a brand new segment that I'm going to be doing on my show, and that segment is called the Lifer of the Month. Basically, every month I am going to be highlighting one person from the OT for Life community and bringing them on the show to share a little bit more about them. My goal is and has always been to connect and inspire occupational therapy practitioners, and this will be a way that I can continue to connect the OT community and share some of the amazing people that I meet with you. So for the first edition, I'm so excited to announce this, the first lifer of the month, I want to introduce you to Lauren Burns. Now, being that this is a brand new segment, I didn't even tell Lauren what was going on until we started recording. So here's my chat with Lauren, the first official lifer of the month. Welcome to the show, Lauren. Hi. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I am really excited. I know you don't even know what's going on yet. I have some awesome news to share with you and... I'm starting this brand new segment on my show. And basically, I will be featuring some people from the OT for Life community. And I'm honored to tell you that you are my very first feature of the Lifer of the Month. What? Woo! Yeah. So exciting. (laughs) I'm hardcore fangirling. Oh my gosh. I thought about wearing my OT for Life shirt, but... I wore, I wore my other one. You got your OT is my jam shirt. I got that one too. I, I love that I one. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, surprise. I have been just like so excited to share this with you and 
yeah, like, ah, I got this just like crazy idea. And I was like, I'm going to do it. And Lauren is going to be the perfect person to kick this off with. So I'm honored to have you on. And the big thing is, is I know that podcasting can kind of be it's kind of one-sided. Like it's either like me talking or me and a guest or me and a couple guests. But the big thing that I really want to start doing is bringing in some of the voices, bringing in some of the people from the OT for Life community and sharing who these people are because you've been such a big, huge, massive supporter of the show. And I can't thank you enough for like the love and the support and everything that you have shown for my show and everything that I'm up to. So I just want to share who you are with the OT for Life community and let them get to know you a little bit better. I am so honored. This makes me so happy. So you live in the Columbus, Ohio area, and you work in a skilled nursing facility. What was it about that population that drew you to it? Well, it really all started with my grandparents. So when I was in high school, my grandma had a home health occupational therapist come to her house And I was really fascinated by the way that OT took my stubborn grandma and was able to find ways that were creative enough so that she could still be independent. But she was also really smart in her anatomy and physiology. And I was like, this is kind of cool. So when I went to grad school, I went in thinking I'd be a peds OT, like I think every <laughs> OT student thinks we OT. all think we're going to be peds. Yeah, we all think we're going to be peds OTs. Um, And I worked in preschools the whole time I was um, doing my OT program. I did a hybrid weekend program. So I got to work part time during the week. And then I went to school every other weekend for three years. So that was kind of a tough road. But towards the end, we started doing our adult courses. And I was like, you know, I could use a break from preschool projects and helicoptery parents who were like, what are you doing? And I didn't really feel like I was using my skills. And so I always, I love the older adults. Um, my husband's church is all older adults, but I think I was really drawn because I can learn from them. It's less like crazy conversations of like, I had one preschooler who told me she had bow and arrows that would shoot out of her elbows to shoot bad guys. Like to go from that to like being able to ask an older adult, like, what did you do for work? What's important to you? How long have you been married? I'm the weirdo that always asks what marriage advice I have because I figure who better to learn from than older adults who've been married? Like, 50 plus years. So uh, they have like a sweet spot in my heart, I think. So that's kind of what drew me to them. So I have to ask then, what's been your best advice given about marriage? And if you have one, what's been your worst advice given about marriage? (laughs) (laughs) I think the best was one that I got from an older gentleman. And I think he was the one who initially was like, people always say 50-50 and it's not really like that. And I was like, I can roll with that. I don't know that I have any like worst. There are just some people who kind of get caught off guard or it's like the awkward moment when you're like, oh, how long have you been married? And then they're like, they're either not or, you know, their spouse has passed away. And, you know, sometimes that can get a little awkward. So I'm trying to be better about not always jumping to that conclusion first and like asking if they're married and how long they were married and all that kind of stuff before I just ask for advice. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. Just assume. What would you say your favorite part about working with this population is? I think my favorite part, honestly, is figuring out what things they like to do and getting creative into incorporating it into my treatment sessions. So a lot of my population, they're retired, but I always love hearing what they did for work or what they like to do as hobbies. I just like being more creative. Um, And the physical therapist I work with is actually really good about that, too. We had a resident that was going to fly to Hawaii after her stay with us. She had kind of low endurance. And I was like, well, let's practice, like simulate like you're going to the bathroom on an airplane because that is what was worrisome. So I go home and Google like the dimensions of an airplane bathroom. And I kind of set it up in my gym with cones and I tied some TheraBand together so we could practice pulling up and down pants without actually doing it because we're in the therapy gym. So that to me is like invigorating, trying to find things that are really meaningful to them. And then me getting to put on my creative hat of how can I make this happen that we can try it before you go home and do it. I love that. Did you ever hear back like how it went afterwards? Yes. That residence went to Hawaii. They actually sent, sent a postcard 
to our building with this tool. So <laughs> it was still cool to hear that he thought about us and sent mm-hmm. us a postcard with a picture of Hawaii on it. Yeah. I mean, you guys yeah. helped get them there, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That was cool. That's awesome. I love, I love hearing stories like that. Okay. Another question. What would you say has been your hardest learning obstacle in becoming? Because I know that you are somewhat of a new grad. I mean, you're getting mm-hmm. close to that year mark, but what would you say has been kind of the biggest obstacle or the hardest thing that you had to overcome either as a student or as a new practitioner? So I graduated a year ago in May. So that's pretty crazy to think about. I think the biggest obstacle for me has kind of been my own confidence as a therapist. So I had kind of an interesting first level two experience with an evaluating therapist that was my field work educator that it wasn't probably wasn't the best match. Um, I learned a lot. There are a lot of skills I learned from that in the acute hospital. And so there were a lot of things I learned there that still come in handy for some of my patients in skilled nursing in terms of like rolling and boosting and some of those like more medical things. But my bigger thing I think has been just confidence because I'm the only therapist in the building and I don't really have a mentor. So I have a huge shout out to Mandy from Senior Flourish because that is sometimes my lifeline. And that is where I get a lot of good ideas and how to try to think more occupation based. I listen to her podcast. I listen to some other podcasts too. But just for me, that confidence the confidence piece of getting to know that I am qualified to do all these things, even though I don't have specialties in everything yet, but then also trying to navigate, okay, what do I want my specialties to look like? Do I want any specialties yet? Trying to balance like who I kind of have on my caseload now and what I'm really interested in learning and how I can be a better therapist for them. So kind of in the same vein, what would you say that like, one piece of advice would be for somebody that maybe is just graduating or getting their first OT job, knowing now what's been kind of a sh- one of the struggles for you, what would you say to somebody or what would you say to yourself a year ago? I think I would say to not be afraid to reach out. And honestly, the OT community on Instagram is amazing. <laughs> I've literally never met any of them in real life, but I always feel like there are certain people that I know that I can message who are either in the same setting or population that I work with or who just offer resources like Mandy is always willing to like answer questions and just to not let whatever fieldwork experience you have be the defining factor of your first year of practice. And I think I'm still kind of getting over that. I had a very interesting second level two fieldwork. I was doing community mental health um, in the homes, but it wasn't like traditional home health. It was like a little bit bizarre and weird. And so in some senses, I felt like I wasn't ready for skilled nursing because I didn't have any fieldwork in skilled nursing. But also to know that like, if it's the job you want and a company that your values can stand behind, then you might as well go for it because I ended up getting the job and it's been great Un- until the pandemic, but <laughs> yeah. we don't talk about that. <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's a whole nother thing there. A whole yeah, that's a whole other, other, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that you said, well, I mean, there's, there's so much in actually what you just said there, but the, the connection piece and being able to reach out is actually huge. And literally I posted yeah. today about accountability OT accountable OT yeah. and literally like having OT practitioners there to connect with, to push you to meet your goals and just to continue to like inspire and be better. And I know how instrumental so many OT practitioners that I know have been in my life and pushing me to reach my goals. So I love that piece of it. But then I also love what you said about not letting your field works define you because I think a lot of students struggle in fieldwork and I had my own struggles in a lot of my fieldworks as well. And if I would have sat there and like let that impact me, then I wouldn't be where I am today. So it's a good learning opportunity and you kind of take from it what you can, but then don't let it hold you back from pursuing something that maybe you don't have experience in because you never know until you try. Yeah. Okay. I want to know... What is your most memorable moment as an OT practitioner? My most memorable moment, I had a resident at our facility who came after a surgery, like a pretty major intestinal surgery, I think. But this particular resident, we had kind of a rocky start. They always commented that I talk too loud and would always make like sad comments to the physical therapist. Like, can you tell her to use her inside voice? And it was like really kind of like 
crushing a little bit, but it ended up that towards the end, we had like a really great relationship. This resident loved gardening. Like their big goals was just for them to wipe their own butt. Like from the beginning, like that's what they were like, that's what I want to do. And I was like, okay, I can do that. Yeah. And then towards the end, yeah, exactly. That's kind Perfect of my person. Right? <laughs> um, but it ended up being towards the end, I got to go on a home visit to do kind of a home assessment and just seeing where they lived and knowing like, oh yeah, you'll, you'll be fine in this environment. And they already had some things either in place or thought of before the resident came home and they loved gardening. And so I kind of used that to build more of a therapeutic relationship. And I was actually kind of sad to see that resident leave in a way that I wasn't expect. Like when we first, I was like, oh boy, this is going to be a rough, however long you're here, it's going to be a rough one. But it ended up being a really great experience and a way for me to learn too that I can't judge a resident on my first impression. And they also can't really judge me on my first impression, even though they may say hurtful things. And a lot of residents say hurtful things when they're in pain. So I'm getting used to that too. Oh, I, so much of that resonates because I know I've been judged and I'm sure I've judged when I walk in and I see a client and mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, it's going to go this way. And then all of a sudden it turns out completely different. So I love that, that both of you kind of had this open mind to allow that relationship to develop and not just be like, oh, this is going to be difficult and like <laughs> just completely tune it out. Right. <laughs> so what does occupational therapy mean to your life? Occupational therapy means so much to my life. It really just brings me a lot of joy because I am the problem solver to everyone's like wildest ideas. I mean, within reason. But even in my everyday life, I'm constantly thinking about how I can problem solve and make it better. Sometimes I use my OT brain a little too much on my husband, but it's fine. <laughs> That's what he married into. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> yeah. That's what he married into. So, but it just brings me a lot of joy because. I find a lot of joy in finding what connects other people to their most meaningful occupations. And that just brings me so much joy to, to actually see them light up, especially in a setting where, especially if you come in from a hospital, they tell you, no, you're not safe to go home. So then you go to this environment that's not your home. So for me, finding joy in what do you like to do and what can I do while you're here to get you ready to go home just brings me a lot of joy. I love it. And I know that you had mentioned about the OT community. So I just wanted to give you the opportunity if anybody wanted to reach out and connect with you, where can they find you? Sure. So um, my Instagram is burns underscore Lauren underscore OT. And I also have a blog called OT and Church. I have not updated it recently. There have been too many emotions and it's been hard to Like I feel like I have to process it first before I put it in words. But my blog is really about how occupational therapy plays a role within the church building. My husband's a pastor and I've been talking about this basically ever since I started OT school. (laughs) And we learned about like the Kawa model, which is the river of your life flow. And I have this secret pipe dream of wanting to do it with a group of pastors to figure out what their life flow is because generally speaking, pastors have a lot of burnout in like religious circles, kind of no matter the denomination. So the blog is kind of like my first look into kind of educating not only other OTs, but other people who are either in the church or not in the church about how OT can play a role in religious and spiritual expressions and thinking about kind of ADA standards and buildings and what we can do to be more inclusive and maybe problem solve within our own churches, because there are a lot of people who don't go because the building's not set up for them, or they don't feel like there's a space for their child who has like different needs or abilities, because it's all set up for kind of a normal world. And also, I I just wanted to add to that, because I know during this time, especially with COVID-19 and everything that's happening, there's been a lot of changes in how churches and religious services and, and all these things that typically happen at a very specific location. So outside of people going on during regular times, now people aren't able to go. And so I know that you've been up to some pretty cool things yeah. over there in making sure that people have access to whatever's going on at the church during this time. Yeah, it's been really fascinating to watch since my husband's a pastor. I have a lot of pastor friends. And so it's been cool to see the way that everybody's leaning into it. But what's really been cool about our church is our church is full of older adults. <laughs> um, so the average age is like 
65 and older. But to watch them lean into to millennials who are not the most techie people in the universe, <laughs> if I'm being completely honest, we're not that great at it, but we know enough to get us started. So to watch them kind of lean into it and not be resistive has been a really eye opening experience. I know I have words to write on my blog about it. There's just been so much else going on with the pandemic and the world that it hasn't happened yet. But uh, it'll come soon. I know it will. It will. It will. And I think it's extremely needed. And I don't know of any other resources out there that intertwine everything that you just mentioned. That's my life. And it has been. My husband's been in ministry for five years now. And I have been in a number of church buildings. And I can walk into a church building and be like, Oh boy, (laughs) this is not like, I can't tell you the number of church bathrooms that I've been in that I go. Uh, oh, hmm. like, just so many things that like flood into your mind that you can't really say out loud when you're in the church, but like, I think I'm off. So it's um, been a really fun kind of opportunity for me, I think. And I don't exactly know where it's going. And I'm trying not to put too much pressure on myself that has to go anywhere except to be kind of what I do for right now. But when I was at AOTA last year, I did run across a couple projects that talked about, you know, a couple of the poster presentations that had some of that like kind of underlying spiritual and religious stuff. So I know that there are some things out there. I just haven't really looked into it that much. Yeah. When it's time, I know that the world needs to hear that side of your voice. So I'll be here ready to support you. (laughs) Thank you. So thank you, Lauren, for coming on and giving a little snapshot of kind of who you are and what you're up to. And yeah, thanks for being my first lifer of the month. I love it. I feel so honored. I love the show. I'm really excited that I get to be a part of something new. A big, 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 big shout out goes to Lauren for coming on the show and sharing a little bit about her OT story. Lauren has been a huge supporter of the show, and I am so honored to feature her as the first lifer of the month. All right, this has been a super fun episode to put together for you from listening to all the voicemails and reading all the comments, hearing from you really is just the best feeling in the world. And I also wanted to mention something that I've been doing for the past few months now, and that is a weekly post that I put out on Wednesdays, and it's called The Boot, aka The Best of Occupational Therapy. And in it, I compile a list of resources that I come across each week. I share anything from blog posts to podcast episodes, YouTube videos, and even social media posts, anything that I find that adds value to our occupational therapy community, and then I handpick them just for you. Now get this, a few weeks ago, I featured Tamiko Faison's podcast called Therapy Entrepreneurs and Leaders of Color when she interviewed Dr. Brittany Connors, and a few hours later, I received this voicemail. Hey, good morning, Sarah. This is Brittany Connors. Tamiko sent me an email yesterday saying that we got the boot. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for having a good time with us and sharing this with the world of OT. I feel very honored um, and I hope that we get to talk or work together in the future. Thank you so much for all that you do. But I definitely <laughs> was super excited to see this. So please keep doing what you're doing. I love everything and I look forward to talking to you soon. I just followed you on, on Instagram this morning as well. So now we're even more connected. So have a great day. Thank you for giving me the boot. <laughs> Dr. Connors, thank you so much for taking the time to leave me a voicemail, and thanks for being such a light in this OT world. If you want to check out The Boot, head on over to otforlife.com slash bestofot to see who I featured so far. And if you want to get The Boot delivered straight to your inbox every Wednesday, join my email list. There are so many amazing occupational therapy practitioners and students out there And honestly, I just love hearing from each and every one of you and connecting with you. So definitely hit me up if you have any questions or comments, or if you're like Dr. Connors and just want to drop a line and say hi and thank you. Also, have you heard about the 30-day movement challenge that we've got going on? Currently, we've been doing 50 squats for the past 30 days, and we are almost at the very end of the 30 days. As soon as we're done with the squats, we're going to be picking a brand new exercise and we're going to do that for the next 30 days. So 
If you want to participate in my monthly movement challenge, head on over to my Instagram profile. That's ot dot the number four dot l y f e and join in. All you have to do is post a picture or a video of you doing the movement challenge and tag me so I can share it with the rest of the community. Hashtag accountable ot. Also, don't forget to leave me a voicemail or comment in the community to answer this month's question of the month. Remember, the new question for this month is how do you keep your OT brain and materials organized? I've got lots of hacks to share with you and I cannot wait to see your responses and share them all in next month's episode. Take care and I'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you hear, here are three easy ways you can help support the show. One, head over to otforlife.com to find out more about any resources discussed on the show. Remember, that's ot, the number four, l-y-f-e dot com. Two, share the podcast with a friend, colleague, or anyone interested in occupational therapy. Three, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. And while you're there, be sure to leave a review saying how much you love the show. Thanks again. I'll catch you next time, OT for Lifers. I'll probably be the first one to make a mistake, which is... (laughs) The bloopers at the end of the episode are kind of my favorite thing to listen to sometimes, so... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I I love them and I probably I probably spend way more time than I should on them, but I I think they're hysterical. So I'm like, I don't even know if people actually listen. Most people oh, probably, do. probably don't even know that they're there. But <laughs> oh yeah, they're there. My gosh, I can't even see. I told you I was gonna be the one that would make the first mistake. And how many times do I say OT for life in a day? Gosh, can't even talk. But I just want to share who you are. With the OT light. I think it's because I have a new light. (laughs) The OT light. (laughs) That's what's happening right now. (laughs) Okay. I forget everything I said. No, that's okay. What would you say that, what would you say, I don't like how I'm phrasing that.